Welcome and good morning. I'm Don Knickerbocker, a member of the Conference Planning Committee and staff at Community Solutions. I will be your host this morning uh, for the plenary session along with four speakers who will be highlighting themes of our conference title, Pathways to Regeneration, Resilience, Restoration, and Reciprocity. And I welcome everybody here today on this beautiful day. Um, I'm going to start actually with a land acknowledgement. The land that surrounds us is part of who we are. It reflects our histories. The Arthur Morgan Institute for Community Solutions and Agraria is an organization led by people for the land. We are based in Yellow Springs, Ohio, not far from the place where the streams meet and feed into beautiful rivers. These waterways are central to the indigenous creation stories of this land. There are many other sacred sites and stories near us, including mounds that are waiting for us to hear. We need to protect and honor the histories and the peoples of these places. And yet indigenous peoples are not relics of the past. We are still here and we are still thriving and we continue to demonstrate our talents and gifts. Please join us as we recognize and acknowledge the land. And we invite you from wherever you are to plant your feet on the ground and take a moment to reflect. We acknowledge that this place was founded upon the exclusion and erasures of indigenous knowledge about how to care for these lands. We are obligated to support and educate each other with accurate information about the history and the truth of this land. Decolonization or indigenizing means that we will strive to be in service of the water and the rivers and the animals in relational solidarity with them. And as people now on this land, we must do what we can to provide nature and wildness with protection and defense. This land acknowledgement was authored by me. I'm Don Knickerbocker, Anishinaabe from White Earth Nation, enrolled member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe from the Otter Tail Pillager Band of Indians. And also with permission from Chief Ben Barnes of the Shawnee Nation, based in Miami, Oklahoma, who was forcibly removed from the Ohio area in 1831. Other contributors include Shane Creeping Bear, Kiowa, Jerry Neri, Dene, and support from the Greater Cincinnati Native American Coalition. Now we can start. Again, welcome from wherever you are. Um, again, I'm Dawn. I'm a member of the Conference Planning Committee and staff member at Community Solutions. So I'm so excited to tell you about this morning's plenary session with our four speakers who will be highlighting the themes of our conference, Pathways to Regeneration, Resilience, Restoration, and Reciprocity. I'm so sorry to announce that Rowan White will not be able to join us for this morning's ses session. She has been deeply impacted by the threat of fires in California. She will be joining us for the afternoon breakout session at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and of course, for the keynote speech this evening. Our other scheduled speakers will be making a 30 minute presentation, and we will now follow that directly with a 10 minute Q&A for particular speakers. Please post your questions in the chat. Each of these speakers will also be in one of six breakout sessions this afternoon. We'll, we'll be able to go in much more depth and have more conversations. So now our first speaker is the executive director of the Arthur Morgan Institute for Community Solutions. Susan Jennings. Susan is a visionary leader and speaker who has led the organization to make strong commitments to build a thriving local food system, to educate people on regenerative agriculture and community resilience. Susan will be speaking 
to the moment we find ourselves in at a time of so much uncertainty and unraveling and how we can move forward with hope and energy. Thank you so much, Don. I really, really appreciate, really appreciate the introduction and the beautiful land acknowledgement. Uh, now, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. There we go. So I'm so thrilled to be here this morning and I wanted to give an acknowledgement to the amazing speakers yesterday for those who were able to join us and for those who weren't able to join us. It was really a great day listening to kind of philo philosophical context and then also the many, many practical things that people are doing um, to regenerate the planet. And I'm go going to be referring to a few of the speakers um, and, and what they talked about, um, just because I think one of the pleasures of conferences is actually starting to develop some threads between talks. And that's a little harder when you're not in the same room and it's not necessarily the same uh, group of people attending each presentation, but I'm hopeful that if I say anything that makes you curious, you'll think about um, watching the presentations, which we will be posting over the next few weeks onto our YouTube site. So having said that, I wanted to start off with acknowledging Adam Sachs's really great presentation yesterday morning um, in which he talked about collapse. And he, he referenced um, <clears throat> Joseph Tainter's books, coll book Collapse, but there's also a collapse that was written um, by Jared Diamond. Uh, many of you uh, may know of the book and the film that was done. One of the things that's really interesting about Diamond's work and, and also Tainter's is this, first of all, or I should say two things. First of all, that most societal collapses across time have at root some sort of environmental degradation and especially soil loss. So we're, that definite, that, that, directly relates to the conversation we're having here. The other thing that's very interesting that um, one of the key threads of Diamond's book is that societies that recognize that they're in collapse or that they're in trouble and do something about it are far more likely to succeed or to make it through the transition than those who just keep rolling along and, and trying to pretend that things are gonna get better without substantive changes. So, um, I would hope or I would think that pretty much anybody who's in this conference and certainly all the speakers are understanding that we are in this huge transition <clears throat> that you can see reflected in these books that I, I put. These are just a, a sample of the books that have been written about the great transition or the great turning or this huge shift that we as a society are going through um, and that we could choose to really go through mindfully. Uh, I would guess that we've been in transition for at least three decades. We probably have another three decades of transition and we're not quite sure what's gonna be, what the world will look like in three decades, but it will certainly look different if we um, are mindfully paying attention to the fact that things are shifting. And so some of the big changes that these authors and others talk about are the need to shift and um, from fossil fuels to renewable energy, from debt-based economies and inequity to healthier exchanges between people and the planet, um, from limitless growth to living within our boundaries and from monocultures of all, time, of all kinds, including the new liberal project, which has essentially taken over the planet to really thinking about biodiverse um, economies and supporting biodiversities and people and planet. And so in this setting, um, COVID is just really one of the Jenga sticks or a card if we're, if we're thinking about the society that we're, um, that we're living in as really just a, a just kind of a card game um, or a Jenga game, and everything has, including you know our our pharmacological system, our food system, our economic system, really were on the point of collapse or already collapsing. And COVID and the shutdowns related to COVID just kind of were the straw that 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 uh, broke to proverbial back. And nowhere is this more obvious than in our food system. Um, and, and some of us who live in farming areas may 
be seeing full shelves now, um, but we you re will remember that this spring we had scenes like this uh, where there were their food was being kind of plowed back into fields and chickens and other uh, animals were being um, euthanized. And meanwhile, we have millions of people that are food insecure in the US and across the planet. So the challenge, as we all know, is that our food system has kind of been built on an industrial model and food is just is not a just in time. Um, it's not like creating widgets. You can't grow food um, at, the, at the drop of a hat, as all farmers know. And, uh, and it's also a very brittle and, and uh, a very brittle system which is um, not going to be repaired. So just a little bit of context about our organization. I mentioned yesterday that we were founded in 1940, 80, 80 years ago this month by the gentleman on the left, Arthur Morgan, who's an engineer and educator. He, and interestingly to me, he was really prescient about globalization. He founded uh, the organization just before the onset or the entry of the US into World War II. And although I don't think the word globalization or relocalization were really um, words that folks used at that point, he basically wrote very compellingly that urbanization and globalization were gonna be a real challenge to democracy and certainly to the, um, stability of small communities and the culture that small communities generated. And I think we can all say 80 years on that that has been true, not just in the US, but worldwide, um, that, that globalization has been a real issue. Um, one of the key uh, outputs of our organization a decade or so ago was the, um, was the um, production of this film, The Power of Community, How Cuba Survived Peak Oil. And again, it feels very prescient um, thinking about the arc of the film and the arc of the um, conversation around Cuba, which was thrown into disarray with the collapse of the Soviet Union and had to transition a, um, an industrial food system based on um, abundant fossil fuel into a system of, um, of agriculture, local organic agriculture. So more recently, uh, these are the strategic areas that our board put together in 2015. I think Peter, you were on the board at that point. And um, the, we basically recognized that relocalization, the idea of relocalization and transition was really a key way to make it through the big transitions that people thinking about growing food locally, about um, more localized economics, and in general, really thinking about um, bioregionalism and just, just breaking, as, as again, Adam mentioned yesterday, breaking down the sort of centralized system into units of exchange and units of governance that are actually productive. <clears throat> So uh, three years ago, three and a half years ago now, we bought a farm at auction. It was just after our um, first soil conference. And Peter, you were there. Peter, you were there for a lot of this. <laughs> so this huge farm, or it was a 250 acre farm came up on the outskirts of Yellow Springs, came up for auction. And um, a number of our members, you can see the people over in the left-hand side who encouraged us to buy it. A number of people came forward with offers of loans and gifts. And we ended up buying 128 acres, which we called, um, uh, which we now call Agraria. So one of the reasons we were interested in uh, purchasing the farm beyond um, thinking of the of, of, um, models for the relocalization of food is the recognition that our food system, um, the way that we do food beyond being unsustainable in terms of getting food to the people who need it really is not benefiting the environment, it's not benefiting farmers, it's not benefiting community members. So as you know, climate change is, is impacted by the way we grow our food. Um, agriculture, uh, there's estimates that up to 40%, I think, of our greenhouse gas emissions are somehow related to the way that we grow our food. Um, and also, obviously, impacts, um, climate change imp change impacts our farming. Here in Ohio, um, climate change manifests primarily as too much water or not enough water. And sometimes that's both in the same season as happened in 2018 here. We're also impacting obviously waterways. This is the end algal bloom in uh, Lake Erie. 
our, um, our runoff from Agraria actually goes to the Gulf of Mississippi and the Miami River um, that we're, we're part of the Miami River watershed actually is the number two um, contributor of nutrients to the um, dead zone in the Gulf of Mississippi. And as I mentioned, it's not really the system, the current system is not really benefiting community or farmers either. Although we have um, agriculture as the number one industry in Ohio, uh, last year we had approximately $2 billion worth of soybean harvest and $2 billion of corn harvest. But farmers, 40% uh, of their income is actually government subsidies or insurance. So farmers are not necessarily making money off of all their really hard work. Um, and only 8% of the food that we eat is actually grown locally. So most of the harvest from Ohio and from the Midwest goes internationally or goes into biofuels or into uh, the stomachs of cattle. So um, now we have this wonderful pandemic that's, that's making everything really clear to all of us. So I would say that that's a gift of the pandemic is that what was obvious to maybe a small group of people is now becoming obvious to lots of people that we cannot keep going the way that we are. And what's really exciting to me about our understanding now of the pandemic is, as um, many folks mentioned yesterday, thinking about soil or biodiversity regeneration as really a bedrock of solving a number of our problems. I think it, it's really great to have clarity that you don't need to necessarily work on 25 different fronts to repair things, that much of what is wrong with the planet right now is how we deal with food, with, um, with the planet and with each other within those food exchanges and land exchanges. So this, um, this book is, uh, there are a number of articles now just really relating how the, the um, assault on biodiversity internationally by the international food system really is a prime cause of the pandemic and that vaccines notwithstanding, we're really, what we really need to do is to be repairing biodiversity or we're gonna just be in the sort of a downward spiral of health and um, our, the health of ourselves and the health of the planet. So um, just now going into the solutions-based piece of this, um, for Agraria, the, there are three or four big, um, projects that we're working on. I'll start with a restoration piece. We're working with the Nature Conservancy on a 60 acre restoration of Jacoby Creek, which is an important watershed for the city of Xenia. And essentially what they're doing is they're taking a channelized stream and re-meandering it. And then um, we are taking out all the invasive species and replacing them with natives. So the, the black um, line uh, meandering down uh, the length of agraria is Jacoby Creek. Um, we're also working with farmers and partners on, um, on modeling as many regenerative practices as possible on agraria. And I, I really like both Judith's and um, Chad Bittler, Greenacre's Chad Bittler's conversation yesterday. I think one of the exciting things about regeneration is it's really, it is a multi a participatory sport, I think Judy called it, basically that you can be regenerating on multiple scales. Everybody can, everybody can be a part of it in their front yard or again by the food they buy. So what we, we recognize that we're not gonna transform all of Ohio likely from our little spot, but that we can provide models for farmers and gardeners. So up in the left-hand corner, that's Jason Ward. He's our farmer whom you'll see uh, later on today. He has transitioned our, uh, most of our fields to organic. Um, we're following all the NRCS soil health principles, including keeping ground covered. It's uh, mustard in the right-hand field, which is one of the cover crops Jason's planted. Bottom right-hand corner is a forest farming workshop that we partnered with Peter and his Permaculture Institute on. Um, basically, we as we've been removing um, uh, invasive species, where we've been replacing them with natives and so, and working on permaculture plantings and uh, reforestation. We're also working with the Land Institute, and you can hear David Van Tassel tomorrow, um, who's one of their researchers. On the left-hand side, this is a this is a sylphium plant, which is a, um, a perennial sunflower. And essentially, what we're doing is exploring um, with the Land Institute whether sylphium works in Ohio and the importance of perennial plants are they generally have huge um, root structures so they really build soil and hold water which are both important things to do and then um, really thinking about plants that are multifunctional so in this case uh, these sunflowers 
can be forage, they can, uh, they can produce oil that can be used in cooking or biofuels, and then just as a, um, just as a food source for folks as well, for people. We also have been um, doing a lot of um, plantings and work to increase biodiversity. That's a blue heron in Jacoby Creek that our webcam picked up, it's really beautiful. Uh, we're working with a number of colleges and universities on research projects and with uh, um, Tecumseh Land Trust and others on a bluebird project. You'll, and then in the left-hand corner, you'll see that we're doing a lot of pollinator gardens. And also that, that actually, that garden was built over a bioswale, which Peter helped put in a couple of years ago during a permaculture workshop. So one of the, beyond restoration, if we're looking at resiliency, that really is thinking about how, again, how do we think about relocalizing our economies and especially how do we think about growing food closer to home? So 150 years ago, this was a typical, this, these, this was actually, we got this output from, or this list from the ag census of 1870. So the farm that was agrarian at that point, the, this is the output of the farm and this, would not also include um, the vegetables and other things that farmers would be growing for their own use. These are just things that actually went on the open market. So you can see that um, 150 years ago, we were able to live pretty close to home and supply most of our needs. And then to Don's point even earlier, if you think about the indigenous peoples who lived here for hundreds, if not thousands of years, who lived sustainably and obviously fed themselves without destroying the, um, the land around them. So how, how do we think about mindfully um, relocalizing in given the challenges of equity, the challenges of repair of um, our, our relationship with our indigenous uh, neighbors and uh, African-Americans um, who have all both been, both populations being delanded. So just a couple of the things that we're working on, we had a wonderful conference in collaboration with many other partners on black farming in September. And we now have a network of um, developing a network of black farmers and developing training for underserved farmers in regenerative practices. We're also working with a, with a group in Springfield. We recently were awarded a $400,000 grant from um, the um, USDA to do a a project by a land land kind of like a mini agraria in Springfield, uh, seven acres. Um, we last year, um, it became obvious and I think that it's going to continue to be obvious that we really need to be growing food everywhere on the scale of World War II victory gardens. So we've been doing trainings locally and the, the photo on the bottom right is our market garden where we're starting to grow food to deliver to pantries. We've, we've also been buying food from local farmers who were impacted by um, the shutdown of restaurants and other, um, other, uh, other markets um, because of COVID. And we're looking toward next year to develop a collaborative CSA with our local farmers um, and, and having uh, subsidized boxes for Dayton and, and other areas that are food insecure. Um, we, we're really excited about the idea of cooperatives and how they can, um, while we're relocalizing, thinking about dealing with the equity issue and participation and co-ops feel like a really good model that, have been, that has been proven. We're working with co-op Dayton and, and very interested in um, continuing to work to support the growth of our local food system. And I think everybody on this call would know this already, but essentially um, one of the challenges of relocalization is that over the past, I, I would say primarily since World War II, but most of our, most of the infrastructure for food right now is really focused on the cargills of the planet. So it's, it's almost like having to start from scratch and in, in um, developing supply chain um, logistics for local food. But there's a lot of people doing very interesting work and we're um, really grateful to be working with some of them and learning, learning from others. Also on the resiliency end and reciprocity, we're doing quite a lot of education. We were able to get a grant from the Ohio EPA to develop a teacher training. On the right-hand side, you'll see teachers throwing seed balls into one of our, um, 
one of our fields, we had 36 educators here from regional schools um, coming to study how soil health could be used um, across the curricula. Um, and we've had several field trips um, from, from, again, from area schools. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so wonderful to have kids here. And uh, you, if you heard Meredith Workey, one of our educators speaking yesterday, you'll understand that the educators are also thinking uh, how, to, how to think about regenerative education. So not just a kind of um, standard, uh, just the facts ma'am education, but really using education as a way to revision and to regenerate. Um, there's actually, which I'll talk about in a second, there's an organization called Regenerous, Regenesis that we're partnered with to do a regeneration um, conference. But one of the things that they they talk about is thinking about regenerative practice as a practice that evolves all the players in the system. So it's not just, it's moving from let's repair things to let's move forward in a way that evolves the system, but then also involves all the players. So we're not, we are not, um, I wouldn't say that we're in a place where we understand all of it, but we are in a place of inquiry. And I, as um, Don mentioned, thinking about being, having two ears and one mouth and, and having the right people around the table to help us understand how to move forward. Um, also in terms of reciprocity, we're working with uh, eight colleges and universities on education and internships. That's up in the left-hand corner, that's folks from Central State University, which is a, historical black university that received land grant status just a few years ago. And we signed a comprehensive MOU with them and work with them on a number of research and education projects. We're also working with a number of um, national partners, including, uh, okay, now of course it's jumped out of my head, Dan Kittredge, Bionutrient Food Association, Peters, um, Permaculture Institute of North America and other national organizations that are that are interested in the same thing, um, including Adam Sachs Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. And then in the left, the bottom left-hand corner, that's a beautiful seed library. Um, I was able to visit Bandana Shiva's Navdanya farm last uh, January, just before COVID. And um, wow, and also had a chance to visit Matrana Katen, which is a partner organization of ours in um, also in India. So this is the one, just thinking about the future, um, again, thinking about regenerative communities of practice, how do we think about the work that we're doing as a way to not just get the product, which is a repaired planet, but really heal ourselves and our communities in the process. This, um, we recently received um, wildlife uh, certification as did the whole village of Yellow Springs. And there were a number of organizations that worked together on that. And that's kind of a model for, I think how we as a as an organization and then um, we as a as a um, planet can move forward. And these are some of the communities of practice that we're developing. Um, just to note a couple this um, winter, we're doing a climate adaptation workshop in partnership with the National Institute for Acl Applied Climate Science for land stewards across Ohio, obviously doing education with gardeners and educators and um, healthcare professionals, which I'll mention in a minute. And then um, very excited to work on with Regenerous, Regenesis on bringing together um, stakeholders from our region to talk about what it might look like to address the transition of our neck of the woods, our bio region into a regenerative um, community. We also, because of COVID, again, this is one of the gifts of COVID, we, you know, we were able and needed to pivot rather quickly as all of us did um, in uh, late March and early April. But the benefits of that are that we really ended up um, really increasing, uh, increasing our media, increasing our output and broadening the conversation. Um, a couple big things are um, on the bottom right hand, and Corny, you'll see Meredith Florkey, our educator, we are doing a big map out project where we're providing, con helping kids, even if they're stuck inside for a school, get outside into their backyard to think about 
where they live and what how it's related to their water and soil, et cetera. We also recently received a grant from the Ohio Council for the Humanities to do a Grounded Hope podcast series where we're looking at uh, regenerative agriculture um, through the lens of the history of agriculture. So stay tuned for that. We'll be starting to, or to post those in um, January. That will be a year long series. And um, the next, con well, it's not the next conference, but just to circle back to the healthcare professionals, we're recognizing that one of the challenges that we face, uh, one of the reasons why we all sort of look to pharmacological answers to biodiversity questions is because we don't necessarily have the context to think about nutrition more broadly. So we're hosting this conference. These are two of our main speakers, Dr. Drew Ramsey and Dr. Vandana Shiva in June, looking at um, how soil health impacts human health and how that all relates to where we are on the planet. So that is it for me. Thank you so much, Susan. <sighs> Susan, thank you so much. That was an incredible pleasure. presentation. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Yes, and so uh, please put your questions for Susan in the chat. And I know that that was a lot of information and uh, we are just doing so much at Community Solutions. It's lovely to see. Uh, next up, we have um, Peter Bain. Um, actually, we are going to do a couple of questions before we go into our next speaker. One of the questions that I have, um, when you talked to in, the, in your introduction about COVID and uh, right now, I think across the United States, um, COVID is the, le the third leading cause of death in the US right now. And for each um, person who passes, there's at least nine people mourning. Um, and of course we're mourning in separate spaces all over the United States. And you talked about the sense of hope that we can feel and um, some of the, the silver linings and, and the lessons that are learned um, through this time of distancing from one another. And I'm wondering if you could maybe tell us about uh, how we can as individuals plug into the work that's being done um, so that we don't feel so isolated um, thank you, Don. That's a really great question, and I did. I and I appreciate you recentering us or recentering me on the fact of what a big challenge um, COVID is and the grief that many people feel. I was reminded, and I, I can't remember who said this. Um, there was a meme that went around maybe ten years ago that was "Collapse now, avoid the rush." <laughs> and I think the the idea basically is again that is this the sooner that people kind of reorient themselves to the new reality, the sooner as individuals and as communities and as as the globe, the sooner we're able to um, to be productive. So and that doesn't I think there's like huge, huge, huge amount of grief and uh, disbelief and. Um, yeah, I mean, I think grief is probably a good word for it, not just for, you know, not just for people, but for the sort of trajectories that many folks were on that will never be reconstructed. And, and in fact, Richard Heinberg, who presciently said that we were going to need, I think, 50 million farmers also said that psychotherapy was going to be one of the most important professions. Um, just because we are, you know, there are people, especially people who haven't really been thinking about this and who have been taken by surprise. Um, there's just a lot of sort of emotional work that needs to be done. And I think, um, I think probably that's part of the uh, part of that regenerative community piece is really together grieving what what we thought we wanted and um, instead what we pro what we are likely to have. And I think um, this is not really answering your, answering your question, but it does it does seem to me that the sooner people 
tuck into things, whether or not they're able to be accepting immediately, but the sooner they tuck into um, working toward the future, the sooner they will heal. Because I, I do, I really think that it's the healing of the planet is going to heal us. And it's not, it's going to take something that big to kind of deal with the grief. Um, but I, I do think, and I, I don't know if it's an, a role for community solutions, but I certainly see that some kind of um, transitional um, psychological support, especially for young people. Um, I think, you know, when you've gotten to be a certain age and have been through a few hard knocks, you don't really expect the world to kind of kowtow to you, but that's not the world that a lot of people have been living in. So I think some kind of transitional support is a really important, um, really important work that maybe somebody on this call would be interested in exploring. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's there's a lot ahead of us, and I think it's being revealed. And I think the, your um, presentation really highlighted how much is being revealed in our, both our weaknesses and our strengths. Uh, I see here that Don Cleary wrote, um, do you think there are places that are not livable from a climate slash food production perspective? For example, I live in Tucson, Arizona, and I don't think we grow any food here. Thinking about moving closer to food production. Yeah, I think it's actually a good idea. And again, maybe sooner rather than later, um, when I give a variety of this talk to folks in um, our area, I mentioned that we're likely to be the center of um, we're likely to get even more climate refugees than we already have because we have abundant soil and water here and we're away from the coast and we're also away from the big cities. So I do think there's going to be mass migration within the US, um, even if we're able to somehow miraculously stop uh, migration from elsewhere. So um, I think that that's another thing. And, and even though I think in bioregions and I think in general, we need to be making plans and surfacing ideas pretty close to home. I also feel that there is really important work to do on the national scale and, and folks like the American Farmland Trust and T the Nature Conservancy are actually taking a lead on this to really think about making sure that all of our prime farmland doesn't get paved over as people are rushing out of the cities or coming from uh, from New uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and elsewhere. So it's a big, it's going to be a big challenge, but I think, and I think one of the main, ch main challenges that's sort of brought up by Don's question is, you know, what is resilience? Are we going to all kind of put a bunch of um, tin cans of food in our basement and sit there with a gun, or are we going to think about um, community resilience? And if so, what does that look like? So um, yeah. Anyway. Ah, that is brilliant. I love it. Um, so Richard Sidwell says, what are the best ways for those living outside of the Yellow Springs region to support community solutions work? Rich is actually our board treasurer. So, <laughs> so um, hence why I asked the question. Thank you, Rich. Um, you can donate online. We also are developing lots of different kinds of partnerships. So which, um, which are uh, really important ways for all of us to move forward. So if you're interested in any of the work that we're doing and you think that A, you'd like to support it, which is also lovely, or B, if you're interested in what you might do closer to home or how you might work with us, um, I'm sure that our, you can respond to the email um, and my email, I didn't put here, but I will in the breakout session or, or maybe Rachel, you could put my email in the chat, I'm happy to, happy to respond to queries about um, partnership. Thank you, Rich. <laughs>